Well, I, I think the most innovative marketers in the world come from the world of politics because either you win or you're out of business forever. In our database, we have 240 million American consumers, 550 million connected devices. We're tracking 10 billion online purchasing decisions every day and a trillion searches. We find that brand loyalty is at its lowest point it has been in almost like 30 years. Hey, Philip, welcome to the show. All right, Steve, before Ooh. we jump in, I have to tell you a story. Okay, okay. all right. The story goes like this. In uh, two weeks, I am speaking at LeedsCon in Las Vegas to 3,000 okay. people. In the past, before I heard you speak on stage, I would have just said, well, I've got my speech. I show up, I give my speech, and I walk away. This time, in front of 3,000 people, I have meetings set up before, happy hours set up after. We have, we bought 100 books. We're doing a book signing. Now the conference is like, yeah, we'll set up a whole table. We'll get everything done. Uh, I've got a whole book signing set up afterwards. Um, I'm bringing two of my associates with me. And they're going to just, you know, filter after when I'm doing the book signing, meeting people, finding out what businesses are there, seeing how we can serve them. I don't believe before hearing you on stage at War Room about a year ago that I would have done that. But I have this whole playbook now that I do every time. And I'm shocked by, by the way, and I, got, oh, and I even have the we have social media posts going out where it says I'm the keynote speaker because actually I am the keynote speaker. I'm the I'm the kickoff of the three of the three thousand uh, attendee conference. But my point is is that uh, I wouldn't have promoted it. I wouldn't have done anything. I just would have shown up and in a weird way probably would have thought, well, they're honored to have me. Which is no, no, they're not. No, you're you're to bring value and you're to serve as much as you can. And so I have this whole playbook from after hearing you on stage and I do it every day, every time I give a speech now, I, I am shocked by how many times I have a, a speech ready. You know, I, I have a great uh, a stage I'm going on and I'll offer all these things that I'll do for free and they won't take it up, take you up on anything. Like, I, I don't know if you have that as well. I try everything sometimes, sometimes I know that. This conference leads con, give them mucho props. They've been like, let's go. Let's, all right, what do you need? We'll help. Let's go. Like, it's been awesome. So wow. thank you. I just wanted to share with the audience. Steve Sims, what he preaches, what he does, it works. <laughs> and it's simple, isn't it? It's really no, simple. It's about, well, honestly, it's about caring about others before you care about yourself. And it, I had to get myself out of my head on that one. Well, I, I think probably the, the, the toughest thing you have is you're a very smart individual. And sometimes the smarter you are, the more defined that you've got to overcome these complicated things when the best and most impactful things are actually the most simplest. So I'm, I'm yeah. very thrilled to have you back on your show. Thank you very much for sharing that. But let's talk a little bit more about that. Okay, and let's break into that. Because you said to me, have I ever offered all of these things for free? And they've just gone, no, no, no. Okay. The answer yeah. is no. And do you know why? Okay, so, so what do I need to do yeah. then? You need to charge for that shit. That's, yeah. You see, that's right. the problem. If I give you something for free, that's what you're going to value it at. If I turn right, around right. and go, well, you know, you, and let's, let's talk about this because it's going to help you. Uh, and I know you've already yeah. done part of it. But, hey, I'm really, yeah. really proud to be speaking at your event. That's ex mucho's amount of dollars there, Okay. In the past, mm -hmm. when I've done events like this before, I know I've often been asked to attend the uh, the function that evening or do a book signing or do um, uh, uh, pictures and take photographs or maybe even the night before do a cocktail reception or a dinner with like the high achievers, producers, CEOs, directors, whatever. When you lay it out like that, Nine times out of 10, they go, oh, I never thought about that. Now, every event, and I, I don't know the event you're going to, so this is how generic I'm going to be, but so accurate I'm going to be about it. I guarantee you there is a more expensive ticket than another ticket. So there's right. always like these VIPs. So you can turn around and go, yeah. well, look, yeah. I know you've got these VIP tickets that you're selling. 
What are you offering with that? Are you offering a backstage where they get a meet and greet with the keynote speaker? Now, nine times out of 10, they're thinking, fuck, never thought of that. And you've just laid it and you go, well, normally I charge seven and a half to do that and a picture and a book signing. But hey, I'm there. I love what you've got together. So I'm just going to do that for three and a half. No, no, no. There is no technical difficulty here, but I am jumping in to give you a PSA. If you like what you're hearing, if it's helping you, if it's benefiting you, I just want to let you know that there may be other ways I can help you. Jump over to stevedsims.com, learn about my speakeasies, learn about my Sims distillery, my coaching, any way that can help you. But again, if it helps you, great. If not, then listen to this podcast and at minimum action what you're doing. Anyway, I'm going to get you back to your usual showing. Enjoy the rest of the show. Bye for now. So I will, oh, I'm giving away. I'm I'm telling you, there's all these stages I speak at that are probably listening to this going, you wanker. That's what you did to me. But, and I'm probably going to get screwed on the next time I try it. But the bottom line of it is, if you give them the price and then say, hey, I'm there and I like it and you reduce it, they're not looking. If I tell you I do this for seven and a half, but I'll I'll do it for you for three and a half, what's the number that's sticking in your head? It's a seven and a half, isn't it? Discount, discount. I'm getting You're a getting discount, a discount right? off of a value of seven and a half grand. Now, if I go, it's right. free, what's the value? There's, There's none no at value. all. So I've never got declined, okay? Um, mm. I've always got something. Or they've gone, do you know, we don't have the space or we're not going to be doing this. Yeah. And so I've gone, okay, and I don't do it. But here's the other little flip. Yeah. And I'm a little bit concerned about talking about this because I'm actually in the midst of a deal now where this is going on. I offered the book signing and the photographs and they've got a very large group going. This is a big event. I think this is like about 8,000 people that are going to this event that I'm speaking at, of which 450 are our top producers. By me saying what I've just said to you, they've bit my arm off and they've gone, great, photograph? And a, and a book signing would love to. Where do I buy 450 of your books? So not only have I got paid to sign the book that I'm selling them, you know, it's all wrapped on top of the speaking gig. So it just adds. Oh, no, you're all, yeah, and, and I have had them buy my uh, book. In fact, that's a great way to get your book back up on the bestsellers list is they buy, you know, 500 books at once. And all of a sudden, Amazon's like, holy cow, you're yep. back at number one. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So it, that that's a good way of doing it. But I would, I think your problem is that you offered it for uh, free. And that was the thing. I probably should take your master class. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, I, I probably should just go ahead and Well, I think it. I, you're, so, like, you're um, already using a lot of it. I think the problem is, it's like all ideas. They don't have to be brilliant, but they're all useless without implementation. I'm just very, very proud that totally, you're using it. That's right. So that's let's right. flip. You are, you, you're a repeat offender. You're back on the show. So thank you for coming back, my pal. Um, thank you. you for anyone that hasn't listened to your last podcast, then go back into the podcast page, search up Philip Stutz, and you'll see him on there. Political marketing genius. Okay. You really are super duper sharp at analyzing trends, data, and then working with them. So you are a man of action. But we were talking about it before, and we were talking about, and the the word came up, you know, political marketing, and everyone wants to run for the hills the second you start getting involved in it. But you have a flip. So tell us why we should be talking about political marketing. Well, I I think the most innovative marketers in the world come from the world of politics because either you win or you're out of business forever and therefore it forces an amount of innovation to win to figure out the right messaging to figure out who your voters are to figure out who every little nuance of the way you need to find success look you do a lot of marketing you know this as well um understanding your customer and delivering what they want is literally all that matters, right? In politics for 250 years, that's all we've done is figure out what the voters want and deliver that way so that 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 politician can win. Now, there's some key differences, right? And I I always, if you're good, we'll expand on this with like the art of the negative ad, because I think that's probably um, 
the most common thing that people think about is, oh, I hate those negative ads. They're the worst things ever. I mean, Steve, why do we do them? Well, it, it creates if everybody it's a reaction. A yeah, it yeah. works. <laughs> it works. Like, it, it works. Like, that's it. It's that simple. Like, we didn't do them because they don't work. We do them because they work. We didn't do them. If it annoys you, sorry, it still works. I was on a, a interview the other day and it's like, but these candidate, this candidate I like ran this ad and I hated it. And I go, did you vote for the candidate anyway? And he goes, yeah. And I go, well, then who cares? Like, it doesn't matter. It was only being targeted at a certain people that they knew had to get that politician to win. And in order to win in my business, you only need 50.1% of the market. 50.1. You can literally piss off 49.9% .9 of the market. They can hate you, right? You can't do that in the business world, right? So the principle is the same. The execution is totally different. Hey, the principle of me uh, asking for all these things at LeedsCon that I'm going to speak at, same thing you teach. The execution is what you just said you did, you did to improve upon, right? So the execution is totally different in the corporate world. So we work with publicly traded companies, Fortune 200 companies. We work with NASCAR. We work with NBA teams now. Um, and you know what we try to do is sort of take the principle, apply it differently so we don't piss off any fans mm. or customers or clients, but we do it in a way that draws loyalty and distinction. So it's like the art, and this will probably be my third book, which I'll probably try to write this year. Um, and but like you go right, you 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 jump on motorcycles. I take a gun and go to the woods. <laughs> like that, I I gotta figure out how to balance all that stuff. But my point is, is like you know, like what we're trying to achieve right in the political world is I will take a sledgehammer to your head. It doesn't matter. You're gonna vote either for A or B. That's it. So even if you don't like my ads you're still going to vote because you believe in what that politician believes in, right? And in corporate America, it's totally different. So let me give an example. We work with a, uh, a, a billion dollar apparel company. And they came to us and they said, hey, we love this. I call it, you know, it's like the art of the comparative ad. I, I kind of coined the term comparatizing, comparative advertising. All right. So they like, we love this comparatizing idea. Let, let's roll out and do some tests and figure this out for us. So we went, we went out and tested things. And we found out that this company is like a Lululemon competitor. Okay. So it's like, uh, in fact, I'm wearing one of their t shirts right now. So it's like, one is like t nice, you know, expensive t shirts, they're comfortable, all that stuff. Right. And we went out and looked at the data of all of their customers and all of their website visitors because. I, I, I work and you know, I, I do a lot of data and analytics. I'm sort of a data and analytics marketer, right? And what we found out from the data of their own customers were that they loved high-end uh, clothing, but they also hated cheap athletic wear. Makes sense. They were buying expensive mm -hmm. t-shirts. So we said, all right. And so we launched this campaign that said, don't buy your clothes from a shoe company. And then the tagline was just don't do it. Oh, yeah. Which is, all, right, all right. All right. You're smiling. Are you, are, are, are you, sense, are you very, sen you're, I know you're a very sensitive <laughs> man, Steve. Uh, are, are you offended that I just took a shot at Nike? No, no. I, I, I liked, because I suddenly recognized you. And I was like, as soon as you said, I was like, oh, that, that, that's cool. Right. And it says, don't buy your clothes from a shoe company. And in your brain, if you like the kind of things that I'm wearing or probably you're wearing, you're thinking, yeah, like Under Armour sells crap clothes. Adidas sells crap clothes. Nike says sells crap clothes. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, but we bunched it all up together. We picked a common enemy, the whole industry, and we tied it to a well-known slogan. Just don't do it. That was the most successful ad in the history of that apparel company amongst men because we were targeting men because we knew in the data that men reacted to that better than women. So we didn't run the ad to women. It wasn't that women didn't probably see the ad, but we could target it to more men. That's what we did. It was the most successful ad. Actually, in Counter, we found out women from the data were actually taking 
uh, where men on average bought their clothing a- after seeing our ads about three to five times. If we ran our ads and they had an impression three or five times, they were more likely to buy the buy the clothing. Women was like 10 to 12. And the client's like, oh, you're really screwing up women. And I go, no, we're not screwing up women. Like when we looked at the data, the data said women wanted to read third party reviews. Women wanted to know that influencers were wearing their clothes. Women wanted other validation. I know this is shocking. Women were actually more thoughtful than men in the purchasing of this apparent apparel, comp, uh, the apparel that they, they were selling. So we said, guys, there's no problem with women. Your market is just taking more time and you have to market to that. So we actually ended up running an entire marketing campaign just to women on uh, authentic, real five-star reviews that this company had received from other women. So it was a five-star review across the front with a testimonial from a real customer about why the clothing was the best thing they'd ever bought in their life. That brought that impression down from about a 10 to 12 impression to about a five to seven impression purchase. And we increased the lifetime value of their customer from $90 to $192 just on those one, on those two campaigns. So if you have a if you have 10,000 customers and you increase the lifetime value by $100 per customer, that's an insane amount of money that you've just brought to your bottom line by running no more ads, nothing else, just understanding the customer. And the reason I tell you that is because that's just normal to me working in politics. I'm cons- I'm obsessed with voters. What do the voters think? Why are they why are they reacting to this? What are they motivated by? And then delivering that content that says that politician understands. The one thing I want to break down there, you actually said about the the the, the ladies are looking at other points of validation. So rather than just looking at the advert and reacting to that that single advert wherever it is, they're looking at other points and other platforms of consumption, whether it be social reviews, um, on blog articles, anything like that. So they're looking at other areas to confirm what they've got a hunch about. And so do you think that's common with women over men? Are men more reactional where they go, looks good, I'll take it, but women want to see it across the board? Yeah, on average, not always, Jesus Christ, you know, somebody's yeah, going to yell and scream. Uh, on average, men are more spontaneous and women are more thoughtful. Right. Okay. And the data, not not just in something that's in the top of my head, in all the data we see. I, I, you know, this is a crazy, I'll tell you another crazy, this one's in, this is an insane story. So there's a, uh, a, um, uh, an office chair company called All 33. They were on Shark Tank. Um, they have investors like Tony Robbins and Cindy Crawford and Justin Bieber. Like why Cindy Crawford and Tony Robbins and Justin Bieber invest in an office chair? I don't know. I uh, They came in to us and said, hey, we, we just got more venture capital funding. We got to double the company. How can we do that with you guys? And um, so I, I bought the chair with my own money. I mean, it's a thousand dollar chair and it's, it's pretty awesome. I got to admit, it's a great chair. But um, we said, okay, how do you double what they're already doing? And so when we looked at their, uh, we kind of audited what they were doing. We found out they were spending about 85% of their dollars on Facebook. And I said, Ooh, why are you spending all that money on Facebook? Is there a reason? And they said, well, we hired a Facebook marketing Ooh, company. That's why. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, that's great. But what about, where are your customers? And they said, well, the Facebook marketing company said they're on Facebook. Go figure. And I said, okay. Well. <laughs> I, so I said, well, let's, okay. It, they may be, I'm, I'm, I'm an unbiased player in this market. I, what does the data tell us, right, about your, like your customer? So we, uh, we overlaid all of their customer data online. We tracked their movements online because I, I have a partnership with the largest data collection analytics and AI company in America. And then we put a, pixel on their website so we could track website visitors that weren't buying from them. And then we built, you know, a look like modeled audience out of that. And so when we did that, Steve, we found out something crazy. Facebook was the number four performing platform for their customers, their, their website visitors that weren't buying from them and their modeled audience. The number one platform was Pinterest because during the pandemic, 
women had gone back into the workforce. They were working from home and they were looking for a comfortable office chair for their new office setup in their house. They had never advertised on Pinterest. They had never thought about Pinterest. They just put 85% of their bucks on Facebook. Facebook being the number four performing platform. So what we're trying to do ultimately when I talk about where I come from in politics and is, well, hold on, what does the customer care about? In politics, what does the voter care about, right? Where is their alignment between your mission, what you're trying to sell and what the, what the, uh, and what the customer wants? And in politics, what does the politician really believe and want to get elected to office for? And then how many voters are out there that'll get you to 50 plus one by that one issue or maybe two issues or maybe three issues? So if you run on those three issues, you know you have the numbers to win. And that's what we're trying to do uh, when we work with businesses. Now, one thing I want to kind of like backpedal on or go back to, should I say, yeah. um, we know that there is nothing that creates a bigger trigger than something that scares or annoys. You know, Tay Lopez did a beautiful job of kind of like, this is me, this is my car, I read books. He knew full well that by annoying and aggravating, he would get a greater following, and he did. Congratulations. The guy's super-duper yeah. smart for doing that. And we know that the hate campaigns and the negativity, that also, there's no greater trigger and emotion than hate and annoyance. But you mentioned about the athletics and you mentioned about loyalty. Today, mm. that's a hard, hard, hard thing to get because people are yeah. questioning more and more. In the in the days of my mum, she would always grab this from here because, hey, she was loyal to that brand. Today's generations, and I'm not just talking about you know the, the kids, the era that we're in today, we're, we're double checking, double guessing on our loyalty to see whether or not it's actually valid that we should stick with that company because they, they do stuff to cut corners. So what actually has to happen for you to build loyalty within your brand? Okay, so not only that, Steve, <laughs> if you were to look at the economic uh, indicators that we look at within our data, I know in our database, we have 240 million American consumers, 550 million connected devices. We're tracking 10 billion online purchasing decisions every day and a trillion searches. Okay. If I'm to look into our data and we put out data reports about once a quarter for free uh, on our website, on our winbigmedia.com website, we find that brand loyalty is at its lowest point it has been in almost like 30 years. And that's in large part based on the economy. And last week, the, the, I, I, all right, so before I even answer your question, I'm going to validate the question because it's so important. No one asked this and you're a thousand percent right. Last week, there was a study, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but there are more anti-influencers rising in the marketplace than influencers in the marketplace. There's almost a turnoff by a certain type of influencer. And so people that are railing against the influencers are becoming the new influencer. Ooh, Isn't that crazy? Wow. So the haters yeah. are actually yeah. getting to be the ones that we're looking at now. That's right, because people are going, yeah, I hate those people, too. And, you know, <laughs> but, but uh, so what do you do? It's really, really, really easy. You find out what they care about and you deliver that to them. It's the same thing you always preach too, Steve. It's like, I the, look, I have a very sophisticated way of doing it. I, I'm going to eliminate as much risk as humanly possible in a marketing budget by, you know, uh, accessing the data I have to understand the customer. But frankly, it's this, look, do you, what if I told you, and I'm not talking about you, Steve, I'm talking about you're out in the audience. What if I told you, if you're an entrepreneur, because I'm sure you, you have a ton of entrepreneurs also, that your customer only really cared about 25% of your founder's story. If you knew that with certainty, would you talk, keep talking about the 75% that turned them off? Or would you take the 25% and start optimizing performance on the 25% that really resonates with your mark, with your customer? Every time. That's, that's brand loyalty. 
It's understanding what they actually care about within your brand and then delivering that over and over and over again. When we talk, when we work with a lot of e-commerce clients, they have massive email open rates because their customers love to read what they're writing, but they're also looking for deals. Okay, well, let's, let's do some tips and things like that and then offer some fun deals or offer some incentives or offer a program or offer a bundle or offer. That's what they want, right? In e-commerce world. Like I got, if you don't want to just sell on Black Friday or Labor Day or July 4th sale, then make it year round and figure out, raise your prices, discount them down. Sound familiar from our opening conversation? Think about what they want, whether you use a sophisticated uh, data and analytics system like we have, or you just use your common sense and what you know your customer wants. That's what you have to do is deliver on that. Now, you mentioned your website quickly. I want to go back to that. So give it a big shout out so we're not just laying it at the end. Well, yeah, no, you can actually, the easiest way to do it is just go, I, I gave, that's my, um, my, my marketing agency is winbigmedia.com, but uh, you can find me at philipstutz.com and we give away a, a free data assessment there too. It's free at philipstutz.com slash insights. If you're like, I want to understand my customer better. I want to know what the data look, my customer data looks like. Uh, it's like a 30 second form you fill out and my team sets up and does a 30 minute call with you, walks through what our what what we would be able to look at within your data and show you uh, like literally what we could deliver for you if that's what you're interested in. Philip's a sh super smart guy, so I urge everyone out there to actually do this. I want to get into the um, continuing with the loyalty and how to attract your client. And it is funny you saying about the anti-influencer. I had a friend of mine that um, I say had because he kind of went down a funny path. Um, he wanted to get more influential. So during COVID, he started shouting off about uh, controversy and how people were going against this and we're being lied to and basically started to rally up the negativity. And he got thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people suddenly starting following him, communicating with him, and none of them were turning into buyers. So he suddenly right. started adopting this massive community that when he did an event and there were 20 spots, he wasn't selling any. So it is funny how you, you got to be careful to make sure the alignment between followers and actual clients and, and focus on those. Now, I love you. I love the way you work on stats, but also we know that we're in changing times and mm -hmm. the way that we're evolving – the way we were marketing and branding, and you're just saying now about the explosion of the anti-influencer, now that's a new thing, you know, and now you bring it up, my head's going, oh, yeah, you're right. There's, there's all these people that spill out hate and jeering and now getting followers. What are we going to be seeing over the next 24 months? Because, of course, also, we've got a rather big event that's in your wheelhouse. We've got another election coming up. Now, the last yeah. election we had was probably one of the first ones that was ever run on social. And a lot of it had a lot of, you know, Barack Obama kind of, you know, was on the cusp, but no one handled Twitter like Donald Trump did. And so what are we going to see in the next election or that you can see coming forward and how is it going to change from the last one? It's a good question. Okay, so while you're talking, I actually pulled up the actual stats on the anti-influencer. Can I Please give you do. those real quick? All right. All right. So according to this analyst, it's GWI. I don't know what that is, but it says the number of G Gen Zers interested in influencers has dropped 12% since 2020. And the number who take note of what influencers wear has fallen 16% since then. As a result, influencers and others are making viral videos listing. Uh, they're making okay. The hashtag de-influencing has racked up more than 76 million views on TikTok and is now uh, trending at a higher level than it's ever done before. De-influencing. Oh. oh my god! What, what does that say about our society when we're paying more attention to the haters than those marketing? Uh, look at, well, this goes back to why you can't sell because they're entertainers. They're not, they're not doing anything of substance, right? So they're getting the views because it's entertaining to see hate. Yeah. 
I mean, look at the news media. The news media exists to oh, promote yeah. hate. Always. Like that's just what it does on either side of the aisle. So to answer your question, um, 2016 actually probably was the birth of the real, like, I, I think you're really smart. Barack Obama introduced social media in, a, in 2008 and 2012, but it wasn't uh, from a uh, behind the scenes um, standpoint, it was not sophisticated. They were just throwing content out there. They weren't targeting. There wasn't the ability to target voters. There wasn't the ability to do that. Then 2016, actually, it was the Wild West. The, the, the platforms weren't banning anybody. They weren't shadow banning anybody. You could do whatever you wanted. All these campaigns. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Donald Trump uh, would run one ad on Facebook, one ad, 162 different versions of one ad. They'd have uh, with the with the ad, they'd have a man in the in the background, a woman in the background, of, or different font sizes, different colors, a man in the right corner, a woman in the left corner. They ran 162 versions of one ad. And ultimately, and the, I mean, I'm talking like I talked to their top strategists on this. And they said ultimately eight or nine of those ads blew through the roof to such a degree that they knew they could put a hundred million dollars behind that ad. And they knew it would produce money and votes and massive money and votes, right? And so like fundraising money and, and they knew it would convince voters and they uh, attribute their victory in 2016 to Facebook. Then obviously Facebook was like, oh boy, that's not good for us. Donald Trump, no, 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 we don't want credit. So then that's when all the shadow banning and everything happened uh, in 2020. And then obviously it ramped up. So how does it, where does it go from here? And then where does the economy go in separately in a separate note? And the answer is there is no easy answer. I wish I could tell you. The reason I tell you that is because since 2020 and the pandemic, everything has completely changed. If you're a business owner out there, you know this more than anything else. Every month is different. Like we, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was it was famine. And all of a sudden, uh, the, the government money started coming in and it was feast. And then that lasted for about a year. And then a inflation got out of control. And then it went back to, oh, this is scary. People started to stop spending money. Then all of a sudden, everybody started spending money at the end of the year. Now, at the beginning of the year, people stopped spending money. And now all of a sudden in February, they're back to spending. I don't know. Like, I can't tell you. Like, when I'm even in my own business, I'm like, Guys, I want six months of reserves in our company account. So if a crash happens as a marketing agency, yeah. you know this, people are going to cut the marketing. They always use. do. And, and, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, two months later, I'm like, Jesus Christ, we got nine months of reserves now because people keep bringing in and hiring. So I can't, I can't wrap my arms around this. Uh, I just did a, on my own podcast, I had James Altucher, yeah. and he, he went through the entire economy and walk through all of it. I think he's probably much smarter than me. So uh, if you, and James repurposed that interview and put it on his own podcast. So either way, and it's all about what's happening in the economy and where it goes. I'm not smart enough to know that. I just know I'm looking at the data and all I see is things are changing every single month. And the winners understand the changes that are happening and are adapting their messaging and their money and their budgets around what the customers are actually looking for in that moment. And then as far as the presidential campaign goes, oh, hell, I don't know. I mean, you've got Trump uh, running and you've got, you know, uh, is Biden going to run again and all that? And then what is the advertising that's going to be on that? I don't know because of all the banning that has happened. I don't know where, especially the Republican side is going to put their money this time around. You have to play the game. They have to put money at Facebook. They have to put money in Instagram. It may be a lot more money into Twitter now because they know they're not going to get banned. We know that Google and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram were banning Republicans in 2020, especially Trump. Uh, there were shadow banning ads. There were shadow banning uh, messages and all that. So it, it it's very free flow right now. I don't think anybody knows how the budgets are going to be spent and the platforms are going to spend it on. I do know that eventually these candidates are going to go, I just have to go where the voters are. And if it means I got to go to Instagram, I'm going to go to Instagram. Like they, I know I'm going to spend a uh, hundred, if I spent a hundred million dollars four years ago, I got, you know, this many impressions, this many views, this many, this, you know, all the stats. I'm probably half of that now because of the shadow banning, but I still have to do it. 
that's probably what's going to happen. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on this, um, but there's been a underlying and well reoccurring statement that you've been saying all the way through. Know your client or your prospect and give them what they want. You know, all the way yeah. through, you've kept coming that back. We don't have to complicate stuff. Know who you're having a conversation with. Know what that problem is. And you, you can know what that problem is by, guess what, asking them and then actually deliver it. And the one thing I did like about your social that I've bantered on about for freaking years is that a lot of the influencers are not achievers. They look good in a swimsuit or they look good leaning up against a car, but they've done right. fuck all. So now we're actually seeing behind that curtain and realizing that there is no substance. And that's not a bad thing. No, I thought that would actually play out during the pandemic when they couldn't run around beaches half naked yeah. telling you how great they are and, and showing off their watch that they were making 50,000 on the post on that actually stopped a little bit, but then it came back roaring back because there was so much money in the marketplace, yeah. but now it's, it, it, it's coming home. I, one other thing before we get out of here, uh, you, Steve, were on my podcast, uh, last summer, the summer of 2022. It's a great interview. And anybody that is interested in learning more about uh, how Steve looks at life and vulnerability and all that. It's a great interview. And I appreciate you, Philip. We're going to put all of the yeah. links below. I hope I'm going to be seeing you again soon. I know there's a whole bunch of events. I know we should be crossing. I will say I've seen Philip speak on stage. And as a speaker, I admire this professional. So, you know, if you're looking for a good speaker with some good insight, that's actually tactical that you can utilize. Get Philip on your stage. Philip, thank you very much for being a guest, pal. Thank you, my brother. I appreciate you. Hey, I hope you liked that episode of the Art of Making Things Happen podcast. And remember, these are done for you. If you like them, subscribe, share them around. But if you don't like them, send me an email to ask at stevedsims.com and you can tell me what I need to do to make this the most dynamic podcast you listen to. Anyway, make sure whatever you learned from the last podcast, you actually do something with Without action, it's just a bunch of people blowing air. Have a good time. Until next time. Bye.